let's begin the last session of today. And so here we will have Philip Birkin and Ross Church from the data team and talking th thread four, a catalog of stellar spectra. Thanks a lot. Um, the plan here is to talk a little about what our, our threat in this uh, big data project was about and how these things connect together also to other things that, that uh, we have talked about today. So I'll give a general introduction, then I'll take a more general take on modeling. And from there we will apply what we learned to the modeling of stellar spectra and then I'll give a summary and an outlook. So one of the this prediction catalog of stellar spectra was one of the five threats of the data, data theme. And the leading question here is, how do we discover things from data in the big data area? And a personal question for me is, where, where's the place for the old techniques? Are these obsolete or do we still use them? When do we use them? And uh, otherwise said, so what can be said about differential equations based modeling versus data based models? And uh, now then we want to apply this knowledge gained to a stellar spectra. So this is the core motivation that we have. And uh, so this is the Vista telescope in Chile. And uh, it's going to host the foremost project, which uh, Ross is a part of, uh, in a few years. And this project, then a multi-object fiber-fed spectrograph will be fitted to the telescope. And this will generate about 10,000 spectra of stars per night. And then what we want is we want to get radial velocity, effective temperature, surface gravity, and the chemical, several chemical abundances uh, of, the, of the star. And they want to measure 10 to the 7 spectra over, over five years. That's a lot, starting with 2022. And then essentially we, we want to be ready with a pipeline that analyzes these spectra at, at the rate of 10 to the 4 per night. Uh, maybe uh, adapts after a year to, to a better scheme or, or, well, we'll see. And the ultimate goal is to understand the history of the Milky Way. How do you do this? Well, the standard, well, maybe not the standard, but the, the classic method is physics-based model. So there, what you want is you derive a physical model for light propagation through the atmosphere of a star. Once it exits the atmosphere, it hopefully just travels unperturbed to us, to the, to the telescope. And then you fit the parameters of this model to the spectrum that you observe in your telescope. In database modeling, you would produce an ad hoc model for the spectrum as a function of stellar parameters. Then you train the model on spectra of pre-analyzed stars, and pre-analyzed is here a, a non-trivial concept. And then you apply the model to spectra of newly observed stars. And the whole point is that hopefully this here is as accurate as this, but an order or two of magnitudes uh, faster. So our more general take on modeling is, let's take a step back, and while still staying with the, with the spectra here, is what do we want from a perfect model? So it should use the available information. It should not be biased by the presence of noise. It should be robust against our incomplete physical understanding, in this case about the atmosphere of the star. Uh, it is robust against astronomical inconvenience, such as cosmic rays, interstellar dust, whatever might happen to the, the light, ray of light while it travels a thousand light years. Um, it comes with a quantified imprecision, respectively with a quantified inaccuracy. And of course, it should be fast and, and autonomous, so we, sh we should not interfere with, with it. Otherwise put, um, either we want to predict the future, which is if you take another step back and say we're not talking about stellar spectra in particular, but about something more general, then typically would want a model to predict the future or to enable understanding and, and discovery. And so functionally, this is either a mathematical equation and then the model uh, which describes something uniquely and when you solve it, you get the solution, what you want, or if you have a formula for the solution or a procedure to get a solution, then you get an input-output relation. And then this would essentially look like, well, you have inputs, you have outputs, and then in between, in this box, you have a function that takes the inputs, but it's going to be parameter dependent. So there might be material parameters, initial data, <coughs> geometry, topography, uh, whatever. So this can be arbitrarily complicated. 
And of course, then there's the question, how do you get all of these to the accuracy that you need? And uh, something has happened in about the last 10, 20 years. And the computer scientist Jim Gray has called this the fourth paradigm, and this is the data-based science. So then you have to ask first, OK, what are the first three? And it starts with empirical science, meaning that you, you really you look at reality, and then you describe what it is and deduct something from it. The sun goes up, and it goes down again, and it does so every day. And uh, a year later, it does at the exact same times. Yeah? That's uh, very basic science, and it works. And then 400 years ago, Newton um, and others came up with uh, uh, the relation between derivatives and integrals, which allows you to work with differential equations. And this was a huge step forward, because now you could use differential equations to build mathematical models, and then you could solve them. And uh, so for the equations of motion, this works perfectly fine for a lot of cases. The problem is that for as many other cases, these are too hard to solve. And uh, so this is why 50 years ago, when computers started to, to have serious power and numerical methods uh, were there to, to, to use these, that computational sciences started. And so what happens now is that when Boeing sells an airplane, they do so without building a prototype. Yeah? They do only computer simulations, and then they sell 1,000 airplanes without ever having built one, promising precise data, performance data. Um, so now, can you, can you use this? So does your problem have uh, a differential equation that you can use to model your problem? Well, if it's light generation in the stellar atmosphere, yes. Supernova, yes. The end body problem, yes. Pumping heart, yes. Artificial knee, as well. Uh, spread of zombie epidemic, yes, although it might be stochastic. And if, for example, you have birds carrying uh, disease, diseases, yeah, then this is no longer differential equations. Yeah? Recognizing cats or dogs, no. Uh, Ross had trouble under identifying this. This is a black bear in Canada. Uh, or uh, if you want to beat the best human player at Go, well, differential equations are not going to help you either. The other question is, um, what do you want from your model? performance-wise. So the first question is, how often are you going to evaluate? Only once? Um, 10,000 times a day? How long is it allowed to take? Uh, is, is it OK to wait a month for the evaluation of your model? Um, or do you want to do it in, in a second, or in, in real time even? You know? Maybe even additionally allowing time to send a query to a server from your mobile phone and then get it back. How accurate do you need it to be? How accurate can it be? What's the, the best possible thing you can do given the, the uncertainties in your data? And another very important question is how much human time are you willing to invest? A PhD student? Five PhD students? Or only one hour of your time? Um, and then, how much computing time are you willing to invest? To invest? And, uh, well, that's, uh, I guess, a noticeable trend is that this shifts in this direction. That as computing time becomes uh, much, 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 much cheaper, and will we'll continue to do so, um, this year will a lot, and here it will be not so much. So now let's, let's take an example. And uh, the example I took is uh, a, a heart uh, surgery. So you, you want to prepare uh, a vascular bypass using a, a model. And you have a mathematical model for the problem. And blood flow is governed by Navier-Stokes equations. Then you need the uh, fluid mechanical parameters of blood. And these are well known. Yeah, it's not a strange, it is a strange liquid, actually. Um, but well, this, because it's so important, this has been well analyzed. Uh, then you couple it to a beam model for the artery walls. And again, the mechanical properties of artery walls are, are well understood. There's tons of experiments, again, because it's very important to know these, these things. And then this gives you a so-called set of partial differential equations. You resolve this on a certain spatiotemporal mesh. Essentially, the more unknowns you have, the more accurate this, this will be. 
This results in about 1 to 10 million spatial unknowns. And then what you want is you have an image of the heart as it is. And then you want information about if I do the surgery, so I change the geometry of uh, some of the arteries or the, or the heart, um, how, how does the heart perform afterwards? And then you have about 10,000 parameters for the suggested new heart geometry and get out a few aggregated flow quantities. Well, and this essentially going from 1,000 parameters to 10 million unknowns uh, where you solve the PDE and then going back, it requires a big machine. Um, so if you do this on your laptop, then you have to wait a very long time. And even if you do this on a big machine, um, it's probably not what your doctor wants. So therefore, you use a technique that is called model reduction. And so you generate snapshots. So you do this 50 to 100 times in a so-called offline phase. And uh, so you generate your data to generate a reduced, auto, uh, a re a reduced model. And for these problems, you then have 50 solutions. So for different possible geometries, you have 50 different flow solutions. And then you use a principal component analysis, meaning singular value decomposition, to extract relevant features. And the point is that you can then prove for a lot of PDEs that if you sort these singular values by importance, that the, uh, the values decay polynomially. And that means you can extract 20 to 30 vectors using these techniques that represent your solution to a high, very high degree of accuracy. And for many cases, this, you can even prove how accurate this is. So you get a certified accuracy for this reduced model. And uh, so then what you, ha you have to do, the model is taking a linear combination of 20 to 30 vectors. And this can be done on a mobile phone or on a tablet. So this is something that can be done in, in, um, uh, in, uh, in real time by a doctor preparing for, for surgery. And this is, let's say, this is state-of-the-art research. So this is not what is being done in hospitals. But so there are a few groups in the world who are able to, to do a thing like, like this. Well, so now, what is the new thing? We have huge amounts of data and available, and we can store it. And then uh, I think you had this nice list, or who was it? Um, yeah, of techniques to generate models from it. So here is my much smaller list. So least squares based on Gaussian distributions or, or other statistical distributions as you use the, the student's T. And um, uh, then you have principal component analysis. And if you have only data, then you have to apply some of these methods to this without a mathematical differential equation based model. So an, an example could be the question, do you want, uh, does an image show a cat, a dog, or, or nothing of it? Um, and so then you have a typical image, it's a million pixel with, with grayscales. You, you write down a model with millions of parameters. Well, millions is maybe a bit, bit, bit much, but anyhow, um, in deep learning, the point is that you have tons of parameters. But because you have arbitrarily many images available with cats and dogs, it's no problem to train a model with this many parameters. So in this case, you have tons of data and tons of parameters, and that's why it works out. In the previous case, you have, um, well, you evaluating the model is extremely costly, and then you arrive. But because of the structure of the problem that you know a lot of, you can get by with, in the end, reducing it to, to 20, 30 vectors. And with this, I give to Ross. Thank you, Philip. Um, so. Philip has given a, a general introduction to some of the ideas of modelling we're thinking about, and I'm going to talk a bit about the application of those ideas to the problem of extracting the properties of stars from stellar spectra. So I should start by saying that the difference here from what Gregor was talking about earlier is that we're interested basically in his noise, the the boring ordinary stars um, that, that, that he rapidly got rid of from his first um, Tiesney diagram. And the difference 
from what Sven will tell us um, in a few minutes is that foremost doesn't yet exist, so we don't have any real spectra. So everything I'm doing, I will talk about here, is based on simulated spectra that we have produced in order to test how well we expect the system to work once it's been built. Um, so the basic picture then in this um, modelling diagram is that our inputs are what comes come out of the spectrograph and they are the, the flux, the intensity of light as a function of wavelength, um, lambda here. Then the parameters of this model are everything we know about the physics that goes into making up um, the stellar spectrum, which is primarily um, atomic physics, but then also some light diffusion physics and so forth. And our outputs are the parameters of the star. So it's surface temperature, it's gravitational field strength, the abundances of the different chemical elements in its surface layers, and various other nuisance parameters like the um, rotation rate and the degree of turbulence in the atmosphere and so forth. Um, so the, the traditional way of solving this problem, as it were, is that you build a differential equation for the light propagation in the star. You start nice and, down, down deep, nice and deep in the star where everything is in thermodynamic equilibrium and the spectrum looks like a Planck function, which you can get out of your first year physics textbook. And then you solve that differential equation as the light propagates out through the star until you get to a layer where it's transparent, and then what you have then is the spectrum of the star. The problem is that that model is the wrong way round because it goes from a set of parameters to the spectrum and you want to go the other way round. So you then have to do a least squares fit of the observed fluxes to the fluxes coming out of your model whilst varying the parameters. And that's expensive because um, solving this differential equation is non-trivial and it doesn't give you an explicit function. Then, in fact, so then there have, there have been in, in recent years, and as you can see this is a young field, various data-based approaches to, um, to analysing stellar spectra, um, including um, using neural networks of different forms, deep networks, pri networks with priors, um, doing searches in reduced dimensional space um, and building other inter in interpolators. And most of these approaches actually also are generative in the sense that you build a system that goes from the parameters to the, to the spectra and then you do least squares fitting. The, the difference is that you make models that are faster to evaluate. So what I'm going to talk about... Um, a model called the Canon, which was um, one of the first ones in this space. It's been very successful, um, and it's the one we're working with as the basis for the pipeline for Foremost at the moment. So the idea here is that you write down an ad hoc model for the spectrum as the function as a function of the stellar parameters, and there's a they're, I've called them properties here, but the things I had before, like the effective temperature, um, the abundances, etc., those are the theta. And you have then some parameters for your model, P. Um, and you train this ad hoc model on um, a sample of stars, perhaps a few thousand, with known properties. So in this case, those are spectra that we've synthesised um, ab initio, if you're doing the real analysis, they can be spectra that you've actually taken off your telescope, but you've then analysed using a physics-based model. And this gives you a parameter, a, a vector of the parameters of your model, and you use a regression, a lasso um, a regression to make sure that that's sparse, because that makes the model uh, cheaper and it avoids it overfitting. And then when you, you have your when you have your new spectra coming in, you do all this offline. When you have your new spectra coming in, you do an online least squares fit to obtain the stellar parameters. And that's cheap. So for, for the models we're using, we can do that in under a second per spectrum, which is a, a performance you want given the rate of data that we expect to get from Formos. 
Um, so, Ness et al. in the canon wrote the model down basically as this, where this function v is just the set of quadratic combinations of the different stellar parameters. And so that for about 15 parameters, you have about 15 squared um, element, elements in P times the number of wavelengths, which gives you this, this number of unknowns. Um, and, and so this, this is a very simple model because you're assuming that it's only in each pixel, it's only up to second order in any given stellar property. But it, it turns out that that works reasonably well. So this is the sort of performance we get. And these, the, the next two plots you'll see are uh, being produced by Dominic Ford, who's a postdoc working here with me. Um, and this shows, I don't want to go into the detail of this, this is how good your, the signal to noise of your spectrum, which is, is you, that you can then increase by looking at the same star for longer. And on the y-axis, there's the uh, root mean square error that you get in the ion abundance, which is one of the key properties for the star. So the better we do, the more towards this direction we are, as in being able to recover an accurate ion abundance with um, a short observation time. And these, these show these two pairs of lines. The, 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 the difference between these two doesn't matter so much. But this is a three-parameter fit where we, where we just fit to uh, metallicity, surface temperature, and surface gravity, ignoring all the other parameters. And here we include also a bunch of, of chemical abundances. Um, these two lines are basically where we want to get to and where we have to get to in order for the spectra to the results to be useful. And what you can see is that you need the degree of the model needs to be sufficiently expressive in order to, to get a good fit. So you need to include the elemental abundances in order to get a decent fit to everything else. Um, then if we walk forwards, this gives you, this shows the um, the the results that we we get in terms of the the scatter for the various different elemental abundances that we train on, and the bottom line here is that given sufficient quality spectra, we get a good fit for a, a large number of different chemical elements. So what I've been looking at then is what effect here you have on the training set that you're using. Because what's typically been done to analyze real spectra is that the highest signal to noise subset of the spectra in a survey have been reduced, have been analyzed using the physics-based method. And those have then been used to train the network. But if you're starting with synthetic spectra, you get to choose whatever training set you like and see how well it does. And this is what happens when you do something simple and, in hindsight, quite stupid. So we started out with a set of stellar parameters, um, uh, which we synthesized spectra for to produce a training set. And then we perturbed those parameters to produce a test set. But if you take a, if you take a training set with some locus in your, in, in your space, say temperature and gravity, and you perturb it a bit, sometimes you go outside the, um, the, the space for the training set. So, so these, and these results don't look too bad. We get a, a width of this distribution that's nicely less than 0.1. But if you actually look in detail, you see that the fit is really bad once you start getting a bit outside the space that you'd trained the model on. So then, if you then what I what we did was simply swap the sets around, um, and now you see you do much better because all those points that were previously outside your training set are now inside it. So then I thought, could we craft by hand a training set with a nice uniform distribution across all of the different parameters. And, and that works, in fact, even slightly better for the metallicity. So, what, so this, is, this is the distribution of errors. So you want a nice, for a good 
for a good model, you want a nice tight fit around zero here. Um, but then curiously, it works rather badly for the surface gravities. And there's some, there's some interesting, there's something going on here that I don't understand yet because I was doing this last week and haven't had the chance to analyze it properly yet. But if, if I use this training set, which um, is handcrafted to cover all the space of all the spectra I'm interested in uniformly, I get an, a bias in the surface gravities that my model is giving me for the test set. So I think the bottom line from this is that if you're doing this, you need to be rather careful about the training set. And this is something that worries me if what, if, if, if what we end up doing is taking the, 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 the stars that we have the, the deepest observations of, the best signal to noise, uh, spectra for because those are typically of more nearby brighter stars and that could give you a bias in terms of the training set you end up with. Okay, um, so coming, coming to the end of this, um, we've talked here about theory-based computational models and data-based computational models and I think what we want ultimately is a, a hybrid model of some form that gives us the advantages of both, like the reduced order modeling that Philip was talking about. Um, and so in terms of, of, of growing this thread out of the Pufendorf theme, we're interested in doing some more work on the spectral analysis, but also looking in more generally at approaches in hybrid modeling. And then there are other colleagues within the university, for example, doing medical work and doing, but also in archaeology, who we're interested in collaborating with. Thanks. Uh, is there hope to use machine learning to also get atomic data from survey like foremost? So one can infer atomic data from stellar spectra. It's a bit of a circular process in a certain way because those, the spectrum contains a very large number of lines and often it's the case that for some of the lines you have rather good atomic data so you know how strong a line a given abundance in your star will produce and for many lines not and so actually a fairly standard thing that people do is they anal is you take the star that you if you have a sample of stars observed with an, an instrument with all quite similar properties you take the the best one in your set you analyze it using the lines that you understand and then you infer the properties from all the other lines. But you can do that without actually using machine learning, using these traditional approaches. So you, you had a list of, of uh, papers with uh, different approaches. Uh, so, and and you, look, you, you, you look more carefully at the first one. <coughs> so, so the other ones there, are they more direct approaches to, to obtaining your, pra your, your stellar parameters? Some of them are. I mean, actually, the, the ones using neural networks are quite similar. In, it's just that the model, instead of being this quadratic model, is, is a neural network-based model. Um, then if you do some, and if you do some sort of grid search, that's, that's actually quite similar to, to the traditional approach. So, so one, one alternative brute force way to do, to solve this problem is to, is to synthesize a massive grid of spectra and cross correlate with all of them. And, and, and this, this paper does, a, does that in a rather clever way by, um, first reducing the dimension of, of the grid that you need to synthesize. But they're not, 
and I don't think anyone has really ta had a mod written down a model which goes directly flux to spectrum and it's flux to parameters and attempted to solve that. So in the plot, we showed the uncertainty in metallicity measure. Um, I'm not sure maybe I missed it, but uh, the second line, the, yeah, the red one, uh, where does the symmetry come from? The asymmetry? So, yeah. The model work, the, the naively trained model works less well on low metallicity stars, fundamentally. So for low metallicity stars, we tend to overestimate the, um, the, the metallicity. And there are relatively small, the very low metallicity ones are relatively smaller fraction of the sample, so it appears as a small bias here, but it's a quite localized bias. Okay, let's thank the speakers again.